Hi everyone from Aspen, Colorado. It has been a crazy news news weekend and it is Monday and it's 3.31 here in Aspen. And I thought that I would do something about uh, what's going on in Afghanistan because it is extremely complicated. Um, there are a lot of moving parts and I think it requires some historical perspective uh, that would be useful so we can kind of, uh, you know, basically unpack what's been happening. So I've invited Kevin Barron. I'll be interviewing General Petraeus, by the way, in about an hour. I got to know him when I was covering Afghanistan and later Iraq. But first, Kevin is the founding executive editor of Defense One. It's an online publication that talks about defense issues and uh, national security. And Kevin and I were actually in, in uh, Afghanistan together in 2011. And so we thought it would be useful for us to just basically help everyone understand a little bit more about what's going on. Kevin's a great guy. He's a really good reporter. Let me see if he's here. He is here. And uh, we've become friends through all this. So uh, let's go ahead and get Kevin to join. Kevin, hopefully, there you are. Hi, Kevin. Hi. Hey, really nice to see you, Kevin. Thanks so much for doing this. My pleasure. So, um, you know, like the rest of the country, and in fact, the world, Kevin, I've been watching this really uh, disaster in Afghanistan unfold. And as someone who's covered it for decades, um, I thought that it would be really helpful for us to just have a conversation about what transpired and why it was sort of the ultimate snafu, which is an acronym from the military, Situation Normal, All Effed Up. And, um, and, and I wanted to just start by, Kevin, asking you how shocked were you uh, when you saw city after city uh, fall to the Taliban, and then of ultimately Kabul over the weekend. Were you surprised? Or were you as surprised as apparently the White House was? <laughs> yeah, I'm, unfortunately, I think I was um, for the the final fall. You know, the it was a slow burn kind of uh, drip drip as they as they went city by city, and these these names started coming up, and frankly, names that a lot of us haven't thought about or reported from in a few years now, Herat and Mozar Sharif and one by one. And I'm trying to remember my Afghan map. <laughs> well, go, Kevin, they, call, they started calling it the Forgotten War. And, and, and I think many people diverted their attention from this war. So I, I'm not surprised you had to kind of get reacquainted with what was going on there. Real fast. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I was last there in 2018. And, you know, there's fewer and fewer ways and chances for Americans, to, for at least journalists to go there. There's fewer Americans to cover. Uh, and frankly, this has been the last couple of years of, you know, China, 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 right? So once it got toward Kabul, you know, we heard what the Pentagon said, we thought maybe it was a little optimistic that it would be 30, 60, 90 days. But a lot of us were trying to figure out you know, why would the Taliban try to take Kabul? They could get as close to the city. But, you know, that's where, if anywhere, the United States would help the Afghans make a, at least make a stand or put up a front or do something to force uh, everyone thought would, what would be uh, a, you know, some sort of peace agreement. You know, Ghani would have to go probably anyway. There'd be some power sharing. But, uh, you know, no, there's no way the Taliban could militarily take Kabul if the Afghans and the Americans, you know, wanted to prevent them. Turns out they didn't have to. The Taliban just walked right in. Well, you know, uh, this has been a disaster for President Biden politically and and I think militarily. And do you agree with what he said just recently, just a, uh, like an hour ago in his speech, where he said this was bound to happen no matter when we pulled out? Uh, a couple of people commented that, but it seems to me uh, that that's not necessarily true that the way we pulled out uh, was really um, just a mess. And, and it's, I guess, help me understand how this got so screwed up, Kevin. Well, I, I, I think when Biden said um, he had two choices, I think those, a lot of people are gonna say, those, are, those aren't the only choices. And the way he presented it was, look, there was an agreement the US had with the Taliban, not with the Afghan government, with the Taliban, the Trump agreement, that May 1st was the deadline, you know, the administration actually extended that a little longer before making their decision that, you know what, we're going to be out because otherwise the agreement's off, the Taliban gloves are off, 
and they could directly target American troops. And so to prevent that and to continue to stand up the government for any other length of time would require sending thousands of troops back in. I think he's right to say that, you know, the, the number was down to less than 3,000. And we had reporting at Defense One a couple of years ago, well, well, the beginning of 2019, where we asked leaders, just, you know, senior military leaders, how many troops do you need to do the bare minimum? And the answer then was really eight to 10 to do a really the robust counterterrorism mission, only counterterrorism, but also continued training, advising, having the backs of the Afghans, working with all the NATO troops, it was eight to 10. So once we got below that in the, in the Trump administration, it was always a question of kind of if, or, you know, if not when, or, or you know, it was, it was inevitable that this is just gonna keep going down, down, down. And if the US really wants to extend the Afghan government's legitimacy and keep the Taliban away from Kabul, that it was gonna have to go back up, up to 10, up to 15, up to 20 or more. And nobody, there's, there's nothing in anything President Biden said on the campaign trail that would have indicated he ever was gonna to agree to that. I think one thing that you pointed out, I think earlier in a, a previous interview I, I saw you did is that both Donald Trump and Joe Biden campaigned on the premise that they were going to withdraw US troops from Afghanistan. So no one should be that surprised about that. I think we're talking about the smaller issue and how this operation was done, how it was organized, how it was executed, and why wasn't it more carefully managed? Why did the Pentagon, the State Department, have very different intel about the ta Taliban's relative strength? We heard Tony Blinken say it was going to take 18 months, or it might happen, but it would be over you know, 18 months or whatever he said. So I guess, I guess that's the question. Um, yes. People expected U.S. troops to withdraw, but how did it how did it happen this way? You know, I, I have said from the moment Biden made his first announcement that they were going to end this war and pull all the troops up by September 11th. The first thing that a lot of us Pentagon reporters are asking was, uh, OK, great. What's the plan? If, if you, he said we're going to pull out the troops, but we're going to keep an over the horizon capability ready to do any counters and stri counterterrorism strikes that we want in the country. So we all said. Really? Great. How and where? And, you know, it's important to explain to people who haven't followed. This is different than in Iraq, right? Iraq and Syria are right next door to major American bases. They're right next door to bodies of water with, where you can park aircraft carriers. Uh, there are allies in Turkey nearby with American air, airstrips. So you really can sit just outside of Syria and go in all day long, all night long. And that's exactly what the United States has done. That's why they've been able to claim that, oh, there's only a small numbers of troops in Syria. It's because mm -hmm. they're in northern Iraq across the border. Afghanistan is thousands of miles from anything remotely like that. Even if you count like Tajikistan in the north or aircraft carriers farther south. Uh, so to do over the horizon requires much longer time. It's much harder, much, you know, you can't, you can't do the same. The Pentagon kept insisting, look, we have different capabilities now. We really can do this over the horizon. Yes, it will take longer. The point is they didn't have a plan. The answer at the time was, we'll get back to you, we'll work on it. Then they said, we've stood up a, a, a task force to look into it and the central commander and, and the secretary are gonna look into it. Three weeks after the announcement, they didn't have a plan of how they were gonna do this over horizon counterterrorism. Plan B, that's the plan B. They had no plan B planned. So couple that with a lot of reporters who, who honed in on the current crisis, what's the plan to get out the Afghan interpreters? Cause you know they're dead meat, uh, the Taliban get their hands on them, much less all the other Afghans who would need to help. And I think the government and this administration did not take that seriously. Uh, obviously, they weren't prepared. They didn't have the capability. And we're seeing that at the airport now. So, so they did not prepare for the worst case scenario. They prepared for the best case scenario that the Afghan government would be strong, that the president wouldn't flee the country, and that the Afghan military was well equipped, well enough equipped and trained to manage whatever might happen once our troops were withdrawn, correct? Yeah, the Taliban, I think, called Biden's bluff if, or, or, or the, the U.S. bluff, if you can think of it that way. The, you, you know, we, there's a similar, this is a similar occurrence to what happened in, in Iraq, right? When ISIS stormed through Syria and came right in and the Iraqi military at the time melted away and said, mm, we're out of here. It took many years to build an entirely new Iraqi military with 
by firing the senior generals, by wiping the rolls, almost starting anew and finding a different Iraqi military who was willing to fight um, to change leadership in Baghdad, get a new president that they were willing to fight for. And with the United States backing, start all over again and push back ISIS. I, do, I wouldn't anticipate any of that happening, number one, because the government in Kabul is now the Taliban government. ISIS never made it to Baghdad. But the same principle applied. All of the Afghan fighters who were outside of Kabul in all those other cities that fell one by one by one, they laid down their arms and they walked away. They took off their uniforms. Very, some of them agreed to switch sides, but a lot of them just wiped, washed away. And, and why? Why? No, why? Because they had no loyalty to this government. Ghani, I think we, we underreport in the United States just how corrupt the Ghani government was. Uh, um, you know, we had, we had two big strong men in this entire campaign. We had Karzai, who was also equally corrupt and horrible. And now we have had Ghani um, and the, the lack of the United States. So as soon as the United States weren't going to be there to have their backs, none of them thought Ghani was going to have their backs. And they said, we're out. And in fact, they were not being paid. They were not being sent into battle with sufficient gear and backup and support. So, um, but, but still 20 years worth of training. And well, that is to say, you know, a lot of, a lot of commentators today, and it's, I've been reminded myself to, to keep making the point that the Afghans have fought. They fought hard and they fought valiantly. We reported on it. They have died by the tens of thousands of their own country. So this notion you hear 300,000 troops by Biden has been throwing up. There have been hundreds of thousands of troops that have been trained and cycled through and tens of thousands, multiple tens of thousands have died in the last recent years when hardly any Americans, one American is too many, but this is not, you know, the height of the war. In Very fact, Kevin, let me interject because I have, I put these statistics together, 66,000 Afghan national military and police have been killed. 2,448 American service uh, members and 3,846 U.S. contractors. Uh, 1,144 allied service members from NATO member states. But you're right, 66,000 Afghan national military and police, 47,245 Afghan civilians um, have been killed. By the way, 51,000 or more Taliban and other opposition fighters. So I take your point. And I don't think we're saying that they didn't fight, or I'm not saying they didn't fight. I'm saying that they, their support kind of got pulled out from under them, not only by the U.S., but by the Afghan government. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I think that that's it. it it's... It only went so far. That also goes to the to the reasoning and the thinking behind the military leaders who had argued to continue and to stay. And I know there's a lot of uh, frustration and there's a lot of you know commentary that you know the generals got it all wrong. If only they listened to the ground troops. I think that's a, a gross oversimplification, if not just factually incorrect. Um, but suffice it to say, there were successive numbers of senior four-star leaders who were in charge of this region, this war, who all put forth, this needs to continue. We've said all along, this needs to continue. And, and it's not all or nothing. It's not till the end of a hundred years or, or we get out today. And the, going back to what we said in the beginning, Biden could have said, we're sending in 10,000 troops and that's all it's going to take. 10,000 troops are going to sit and they're not going to have to fight because the Taliban's not going to come after us. And we're going to let this, we're going to make them keep talking it out in Doha. And, you know, we're going to take that chance. And he could have, who knows what it would have done, but it could have happened. But a lot of the senior leaders were just trying to say, look, that's all that it's going to take to keep the lid on the Taliban and therefore on Al Qaeda or ISIS or anybody else in that region who thinks that they have a chance to reconstitute, to train, to plot an attack on the United States or Europe, because that's the big fear that what's happened now is the Taliban will smile. They will do everything that needs to be said. They may even let a lot of people leave the country this week. They, the, the spokesman said that today that they weren't going to go after the Americans. We'll see what happens this week. But how soon will it be before inspired terrorists, if not directly directed attacks or plotted and planned from the region attacks occur in Paris, in Brussels, in London, just like it happened with ISIS a few years back, you know, five years ago? That could be the first sign of the real consequence of letting the Taliban have this land again. So you think that, that Af Afghanistan is once again going to become a major training ground for Islamic jihad? Yeah. And yeah. 
But the question, I mean, do they really need a physical space? Technology allows uh, terrorist operations to be planned and executed wherever they are. There are cells all over the place, Kevin. And, you yeah. know, so so I, I tell me why you think that that this is a uh, cause for real concern. Well, I, because of, of what we saw happen with ISIS, when ISIS took the, the physical territory, it gave them the imprimatur of basically uh, their own government, their nation state, the caliphate. And that level of, of legitimacy is part of what got people around the world to sign up for them and carry out these attacks. Mm -hmm. uh, you're right. They did not, not, most of these attackers, they didn't, they didn't come from Syria and go back. Some did, but not all. Uh, none of them made it back to the United States, but they didn't, again, they didn't have to. We had attacks in the United States of, of people that said they were inspired by ISIS. That, there's no reason to think that won't happen again, because it's not just the Taliban. Again, it, they're not going after Al-Qaeda. They, they all kind of don't like each other, but they'll, all, all in the, it's the same pot. And yeah. so there's well, no reason. ask you, because I do think there's a yeah. lot of the Taliban versus Al-Qaeda. Do they intersect? Are some associated with both groups, um, you know, and, and were we able to, uh, to, to cause damage to Al Qaeda through the US and allied presence in, in Afghanistan for the past 20 years? Sure, that's sure. That's why, you know, Al Qaeda isn't in charge of Afghanistan, and it's the Taliban have come back. And, you know, the Taliban made promises that, oh, we're going to try to govern and we'll take care of Al Qaeda. For, it's not happening. Um, the most that I would hear, and I'm not, I'm not an expert on the terrorist groups themselves, but the most that we would hear was that when we first started to hear inklings of groups identifying themselves as ISIS in Afghanistan, the counterterrorism folks in Afghanistan would kind of scoff and go, yeah, the Taliban and Al-Qaeda hate those guys. They're crazy. They're way out there, <laughs> which is kind of sadly laughable. Uh, but remember, too, this is, we're all talking about Afghanistan. A huge chunk of all the, of all the terrorism pro problem was in Pakistan. It's the Haqqan which still exists. And Pakistan still has never done anything near what would be needed to go after the, the terrorist groups there for all the political reasons that they don't want to. So again, the Taliban having a government, having, a, having the space absolutely allows them to recruit, to launch all the you know, information campaigns they want, to spread their message. And you know, there's only bad things that come from that. Was it, was it crazy for the Trump administration to negotiate with the Taliban and actually keep the Afghan uh, government out of that process? I mean, was that a naive act by President Trump and Mike Pompeo? Because that's putting a lot of trust in the Taliban, it, it, in my view. I, I don't know. I, there's, you know there's, there's two thoughts. Uh, I heard just, just as often as you heard people say, what do you, what do you think? You, you, you can't trust the Taliban as far as you can throw them. An official would say, this is this is diplomacy. You don't trust anybody. You verify. There's no trust in anything diplomatic. You can you sign agreements and either people live up to them or they don't. And then the agreement's nothing and you move on and there's a new relationship. But we heard just as often from four star generals, including General Milley, who would say to us privately and has said publicly, this is how war, wars end. You have to have a peace agreement with the enemy or else it does go on forever. So we support the idea of these talks happening. Now, how they went down, there's plenty of criticism, like you said, of trying to deal with one, but not the other, allowing one group to be, ex to be out of it, to sign that deal for May 1st. And part of the bottom line of that deal was the United States would remove all of their troops. I mean, a lot of us thought, there's no way the Taliban is gonna live to any of these points. So the US can just say, we don't have to live up to that. And I think a lot of people say, think that today with what Biden said, of him saying, well, there was an agreement in May. No, there wasn't. That agreement wasn't what the payment was written on, and, and you know it wasn't. So who, who cares? Mike Pompeo, I read this morning, was pretty skeptical about that agreement. So it, was, it seemed to be very loosey-goosey. But, but, you know, I, I just want to give people the, the, the broad picture of this, and that is, you know, the press this weekend, I know you did a lot of hits on various cable channels and were writing your own stuff. <laughs> um, but, but the press, a lot of reporters are calling this uh, jo Joe Biden's Waterloo. But I have to remind people, this is a 20 year war. Uh, it was started by George W. Bush um, in, the, in the aftermath of 9-11, which I think did seem, you know, that be, it ushered in the war on terror which I think there was broad support for doing something after the horrific attacks of September 11th. 
But then it was almost mission creep, wasn't it, Kevin? It went from retaliation for 9-11, trying to find Osama bin Laden, trying to neutralize al-Qaeda, mm. al trying to prop up Afghan institutions, trying to train the military. Did the mission just evolve too much to the point it was an exercise in futility? I don't know. I'm just trying to, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to imagine how many of the kids on Instagram here know what Waterloo is, much less the, remember the beginning of this conflict. No, after true, true, but I feel like, you no. know, it, well, it initially, I, and, and I remember interviewing uh, George W. Bush on the anniversary of September 11th, and he wrote about this in his book, that 9-11 left him a changed person. Mm -hmm. And he campaigned famously against nation building, the whole concept of uh, bringing democracy or spreading it around the world. And 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 yet then 9-11 changed him. So I guess my, my question for you as somebody who covers the military, you know, was it just unrealistic to think that Afghanistan, after the Soviets were there, after the British were there, that we could shape Afghanistan into, uh, you know, the 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 democratic vision that we had hoped i think it's unrealistic if, if you think that the u.s was going to do it alone and not with the help of a whole lot of afghans who wanted it um and a broader global community behind it um so yes the mission changed um and it it changed mo mostly more than anything at all because george w bush switched wars uh, I believe that, um, you know, the mission changed when they didn't go after bin Laden and Tora Bora and uh, Iraq took over everything. Iraq. Yeah. So having to go back after Iraq to start over uh, with with an even greater, a bigger problem, a harder enemy to fight um, was a problem. And by then, the experience of Iraq left Americans thinking, wait, we can do this larger nation building stuff. And by the way, nation building, I, I, I'm... It frustrates me to hear anyone still use nation building as a four letter word because nation building is what the diplomatic and development community does every day around the world and they do it well and they do it in a lot of great places. Um, and part of the Afghanistan story is a good news story. You know, uh, writers like Gail Salak Lamone who write for us often, you know, covered women and economic development in Afghanistan. It's not the same place by far. Afghanistan still remains one of the least developed countries that's on the, on the UNDP index, but my God, has it changed. And there's, there are a million statistics we could pull up for that too. How many women have been through school? Universities were started, schools were stood up, businesses have been supported, um, agriculture, uh, the economy, there is a middle class that, that has emerged from there. There is a global diaspora that has become engaged again. And there are leaders around the world. None of that existed when the United States went, first went in. So there are positives. That, with, I'm, that so, I'm so glad you pointed that out uh, because I think that's critically important. Um, and I don't mean to use nation building as a four uh, as a four letter word, but I also think there are limits to yeah. how much the United States can do when it comes to, you know, changing the complexion and the culture and uh, of, of another country. But, yeah, but I word. positive thing. Really, sorry, I was just going to say I think these positive things. That was one of my questions for you, actually. How has Afghanistan changed? And you just answered it. Well, and it's, keep in mind, because this is the Afghanistan of today. So even though the Taliban have walked in and taken control, this is a very small number of guys uh, in a large country. Who knows if, if Afghans will rise up again in some, some different faction? Who knows if the women of Afghanistan will have to hide or we'll be able to fight back like the women in Syria did in any form. We, we, don't, we don't know, but we know it's a changed place. On nation building, I, I was thinking more of a Biden said it today as, as a dirty word. And I remember when Bush ran for president in 2000, he used it against Clinton as a dirty word because that's what you know these liberals want to do around the world and nobody knew how to handle the world after the Cold War. And you had you know Al Gore out there talking about nation building and the Balkans and you know we're past the nuclear age and Bush went, no, no, Nuclear, big power, that was the thing. And then nine months later, 9-11 happens. Uh, and suddenly he's talking about nation building a whole lot, just in a different way. So 
look, yes, that went on and on and on, but that's what enabled the Taliban. That's why the Taliban didn't come back sooner. That's why Afghans were able to have a country of their own for 20 years until this last, until this point. But it's the unfortunate reality of the corrupt governments, the, the persistence of the Taliban, the inability of the of Pakistani or the un, unwillingness of the Pakistans to take care of business on their end of the border. All, there's a million factors that went into what happened and where we are now. What do you think is going to happen? I mean, do you think you were saying that the Taliban would allow some people to leave the country? Uh, you know, I, I read the posters of women without, you know, head coverings or not wearing burqas were being taken down in Kabul for mm. the Taliban with its very uh, prehistoric view toward women and violent view toward women would, you know, that would, would res result in, in, that would incense them and create a terrible atmosphere. I mean, what what do you think is going to happen? All these girls and women, I was there. I think when I went with you on that Gates trip, I did a uh, I did a detour and I interviewed a lot of Afghan girls and and women in shelters and girls who had acid thrown at them on their way to school. I mean, it's not as if the Taliban totally went away during the twenty years we were there. They were still threatening girls and women all the time. Um, but but. But what now? You say you, you think that, that girls and women are going to fight back? That sounds really unrealistic to me, Kevin. Oh, I know. I don't think that's the likely scenario. I just I think we, we have no idea. I, you know, here's what I'm looking for. The UN, NATO and the G7 all have put out statements or are about to put out statements about what they think should happen next and what could what could be done. The international humanitarian aid community is already putting out their statements. That, and there's a joint nat multinational statement out of you know, State Department signed on to to begging you know the Taliban to let aid workers remain, come back in the country to help out. If there's any kind of international presence like that, that helps. Um, but we don't know. You know again, I, I won't take anyone in the Taliban for their word ever. Um, but they've been working hard to become an, a legitimate government, not a terrorist organization that happens to be sitting in this land. Um, you know, ISIS never tried to negotiate at Doha with anybody. You know, they were throwing gay people off of buildings and burning people alive. So you do, we're going to have to just wait and see in the very near term this week. Do they allow these flights to come out? The Pentagon says they can bring out 5,000, 6,000 people a day. So we could have 30,000 people out of that country in the next five days if it's allowed to happen. And that could go on as long as the Taliban lets it go on if it's allowed to happen. Then there's going to be, you know, they got to form their government. There's got to be regional governments. They've got to come down with, with their laws, the behavioral law. And we'll all have to see what happens. In the meantime, the Pentagon was supposed to say, while all that goes on, we can still do counterterrorism missions in this country. We can still launch. Well, now they're going to have to launch into an unfriendly government that we don't recognize. You think we, have, we don't have any airspace overflight, you know, permissions. This is now contested airspace in a contested country. So it becomes a much higher risk area to do anything about that. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a worst case scenario, but then there's a less than worst case scenario that might be possible. I don't know. Sound like the Taliban is really equipped from everything I've read, Kevin, to run the country. They're trying to get civil servants to come back to work to provide basic services to to the mm -hmm. citizens there. They're going door to door. They're threatening people. Meanwhile, civil servant or uh, you know the workers are kind of cowering in their homes, and you know Taliban leaders are getting frustrated. So I just. I wonder if they have the wherewithal, the experience, understanding, and knowledge to actually do the the basic tasks of of running a country. Yeah, wait, what's what's the line? Winning is easy, governing is harder. Right? Um, careful what you wish for. Now you get to run the, the federal government. Uh, I, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, who knows? The, the government that that they just replaced wasn't exactly the best. Uh, and that's part of the reason why the, the public wouldn't support them. And this has all happened. Why, why, I, I, this is sort of a dumb question, but why can't these governments be stronger in some of these countries like Afghanistan, even Haiti? Um, and, and why are these governments so rife with corruption? Well, answering this, I feel very white and Western to, to comment on these. But the, the story of Afghanistan is that it would never have a strong central government. It's right. We've, we've, we talked for years about these tribal meetings and these shuras and, and how the whole country was created by a false you know, British uh, map that cut two people in, in half on, on, the, on the map. So you know, Pashtuns 
are already divided in the South. So it's already a, a loose federation of regions that had warlords and their own commanders, their own, you know, you know, traditions and ways of practice and law and government. And to force the national unity government on them was always a challenge. And there, there are a lot of scholars who question that. People question that about Iraq. Remember, Biden was put right. to three, three spots. Let the Kurds have the North and separate the Shias and the Sunnis, and then it'll all be good, like their Hatfields and McCoys. Well, there actually is a lot more Iraq national identity and pride uh, that the Iraqis didn't want that. Uh, the Kurds, that's a different story. The Kurds want their own country. But, um, and so, you know, it, it takes time. I, you know, anyone who's been, who's been a student of development at all knows that it took a lot of time and upheaval for this country, for the United States, to become a functioning democracy. It took a revolution, it took another mini war, it took a civil war, it took you know, all, everything that's happened since the civil war. And by the way, we're still not the best uh, democracy. You know, we're, we're pretty good, but we have our flaws. <laughs> so. I was reading that Canada was gonna take 20,000 refugees and New Zealand is, and what kind of uh, response do you think the US will have toward bringing, and they, should they be doing more to help Afghan refugees? You know, I, I don't know what the numbers are, if, they, if there's been any kind of cap set, but it sounds like that's, it's gonna be a, a, a welcome mat here. I think, you know, these are the Democrats, they were completely opposed to what Trump did. I haven't seen any reporting yet of how much Trump's lockdown on asylum and refugee seekers hurt the processing of people now, right? The State Department lost a whole lot of brain power and talent, who, people who fled and quit during the Trump administration in protests or for whatever reason. So learning how to process this many people, that's part of the problem. Like the State Department was trying to, plus there are extra rules for people from Afghanistan, right? Anybody who comes from Afghanistan is assumed to be a terrorist until proven otherwise for lots of horrible, bad, misguided reasons that go too far back. Uh, but there already have been military planes that have landed at military bases, one here in Virginia, uh, with Afghans aboard. Uh, we just uh, reported a story um, in the last couple hours about um, inside of one U.S. Air, Air Force C-17 um, that there was a picture that went online of just it looked like hundreds of people. And there were rumors that there were 800 people on one flight. And my reporters were able to track it down and find out that there were 640 people aboard that plane. They had crowded it so much that the the crew was told to, to remove people off the plane before they took off. And they said, no, we're closing up and we're flying with these people We can do it. And it's a picture of people shoulder to shoulder. It's similar to ones we've seen of hurricane evacuation zones. They're coming will, to- will you, will you send me that picture? Yeah. Um, hey, so quick question, because uh, some people asked this on social media. With the, it's, how worried should we be about the Taliban who are kind of now considering this a great victory about the Taliban planning some kind of terrorist act, or will that mostly be, our concerns will mostly be Al Qaeda? No, I think absolutely you should be worried about it. That's what I was saying earlier. I, I think um, either planning it or, or calling for it and inspiring. Uh, you know, I, 